Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. I'd like, to, I'd like to kick off with a little bit of a story. And this is a story about two people who are very special to me. Uh, this is a story about my grandparents, my granny and grandpa. They, they were a classic, a classic love story, I guess. They, they met each other young as teenagers. They fell in love as teenagers. They got married young. Um, on one of their first dates, my grandpa pulled my granny out of the way of a, a speeding car with a drunk driver in saved her life and then sort of sat vigil by her bedside as she recovered in hospital. Um, a classic story. They had three kids and then many years later they had a fourth kid, which was my mum. A mistake maybe, but a fortunate one because uh, she married my dad, I'm here and now I have my own little girl. And, and here's the thing about my granny and grandpa. They were two very different people and they're probably Two very different people that, that you have noticed in maybe an older person in your life, or maybe you are one of these two types of people. My granny was always old. I always remember her being old. She, she was in a nursing home for the last maybe half decade of her life. It's not a nice place. It's not a nice place to be. Um, towards the end, she wouldn't recognize who we were, Alzheimer's, dementia, the usual sort of cocktail that tends to happen to people when they start that slow spiral. And even when she was young, she was old, and mums told us stories of the fact that she always seemed like an old person. Whereas grandpa was always young. He, he lived to his mid eighties, and he was always a young person. He, he would walk the dog for five or 10 kilometers every day out in the bush in the Perth Hills where we lived. He, he was always energetic. Um, he always had that sort of bird-like hop to his step. Um, he always had a sparkle in his eye. Maybe it's because one of his eyes was, was a glass eye, um, but, but he was always young. Now, they lived to the same sort of age because invariably what happens when two people have been in love for 60, 70 plus years, when one dies, the other is not far behind. So when my granny died, it wasn't long before my grandpa followed the same way. But whereas my granny spent the last five years of her life unable to move, unable to lift her body weight out of a bed in a nursing home, my grandpa spent the last five years of his life walking the dog and teaching me how to build water wheels and doing the other fun stuff that a young person would do. And eventually cancer got him, probably because he, smart, he started smoking a pipe in Manchester, England when he was about 11 years old, um, but he had a pretty good run. These are the two types of older people that we often see in our lives. We see the, the old, older person, like my granny, and we see the young, older person, like my grandpa. And although, although they lived to the same sort of age, although their lifespan was about the same, give or take, their health span was very different. And that is the crux of what I want to talk to you guys about. I don't just want to talk about how exercise can increase the length of your life. Because if you live out your last five years like my granny did, there's not a lot of quality there. What I want to talk about is how to improve your health span. How long your health lasts, not how long your life lasts. And of course, if you can increase your health span, then by definition, it's also going to increase your lifespan. So we kill two birds with one stone. As we talk about exercise for, for improved health, we really need to think about what the purpose of exercise is. The purpose of exercise is not to be able to deadlift more at the gym. The purpose of exercise is not to be able to do more pull-ups without stopping. The purpose of exercise is not to see how fast you can cycle 10 kilometers. Exercise should not be done for the sake of exercise. Now, if you consider yourself an athlete, absolutely these things are fine. But the only athlete we're talking about is the person whose event is the dance at their grandson or their granddaughter's wedding day. That is the event that you're training for. So when you exercise, think of this not in the context of, I need to deadlift to get better at doing deadlifts. I need to do more squats so I get better at doing more squats. That's not the idea. You are doing the things in a gym-based setting, in a health facility, so they benefit you outside. Because in the end, who cares how much you can lift? What we care about is how long you live, how well you live, 
and the time you get to spend with the people that you love and the time that they get to spend with you. The time that your grandparents spend with you, the time that you spend with your grandparents, the time that you spend with your grandchildren. That's what's really important. My wife and I got married about two and a half years ago. As I said, we now have a little seven week old baby. Her name is Charlie. If you hear crying in the background, it's her and I won't apologize because uh, her crying is one of my absolute favorite sounds. Um, but we were lucky enough at our wedding two and a half years ago to have a special moment where Ash, my wife and I were able to dance with Ash's nan. And we now have a photo, a special photo, and she's still around and still going super strong and doesn't show any sign of slowing because she is a, a young old person. Um, we now have a photo of Ash's nan, Ash's mum, Ash, and our little girl, Charlie. And to have those, those four people, four different generations in that same family is incredibly special. And Charlie will grow up having these th three really strong role models on, on her side of the family, three strong women in her life, in addition to all the other strong women like my mother that she's gonna have around her. And that is so important. This is not just for you, this is for the people around you and the people that you love. So let's sort of summarize so far. We've got old, old people and young old people. So let's talk about how you become a young old person because in the end, that's all we're all trying to do, to spend that time with the people that we love. And I wanna read out two lists to you. The first list, list is the top factors in the research that causes people to have a reduced lifespan. So these are the things that will kill someone earlier, basically. The second list, these are the things that are gonna cause someone to have a reduced health span. Maybe they're still gonna live as long, but like my granny, they're gonna spend the last five or 10 years of their life in, in a state where they really don't know what's going on physically and mentally, their body really is starting to shut down. So. Firstly, those factors that are gonna reduce your lifespan, and I'm gonna read these out to you. Heart disease, stroke, and these are in order. Uh, some form of cancer, lung, trachea, bronchial cancer, um, Alzheimer's and other dementias, lower respiratory infections, pulmonary disease, uh, cancers of the colon, uh, diabetes, type two diabetes, hypertensive heart disease, and breast cancer. Those are the top 10 things in a 2020 human population, those are the top 10 things that will cause someone to die earlier. The top 10 things that are gonna reduce your, your lifespan as opposed to your health span. Here's the cool thing, of those top 10, every single one of them, exercise can help to either reduce or prevent completely. I'm gonna say that again. The top 10 causes of death in 2020, every single one of them is reduced by having a healthy, active, long-term lifestyle, including exercise in your lifestyle. Let's move on to those, to those health span factors. So I'm gonna read out to you the top factors which in 2020 are gonna reduce the length of that health span. The first is lower back pain. It's a pretty common one. People starting to degenerate as they age because of lower back pain. The second is some sort of depression, a psychological disorder. The third thing is anemia. The fourth is neck pain and then chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, anxiety disorders, migraines, diabetes, and falls. These are the top factors which are going to reduce not just the length of your life, but the quality of your life. Again, all of these things can be impacted by exercise. There is research available that all of these factors are, are pushed to older age by living a healthy, active lifestyle. And this is absolutely key. You guys don't need to be convinced that exercise is good for you. It's rammed down your throat anyway. You can't turn around with being, uh, being told that exercise and healthy eating are good for you. But when you see these top factors that reduce the quality of life, when you see these top factors which reduce the length of your life, exercise really is the magic pill. It is absolutely the magic pill. Um, I did some basic calculations. All the benefits of exercise, if you were to take a little tablet every day for each of those benefits of exercise, over... Over your life, you would have to swallow enough tablets to fill a concrete mixer, one of those big cement mixers that you see driving down the street. Um, it's a lot, or you could just exercise with all the associated benefits of that. So how do we approach what, what actual exercise you should be doing to improve your health span, to improve your lifespan? Well, 
We need to look at this in terms of a model that, that sort of encapsulates every element of our health and fitness. Now this is a model that we've created called the range of motion model of health. So I want you all to picture a wagon wheel. And, and on that wagon wheel, there are a whole series of spokes as you would have on a wheel. And, and each of those spokes, it represents a different component of your health or your fitness. So all these things we've just talked about, all these measures of health, um, be it type two diabetes or bone mineral density or heart disease or stroke, um, things like anxiety, depression, physical and mental health, all of these different elements each have a spoke on these wagon wheels. And, and as this wheel starts to turn, invariably it's gonna to get to a broken spoke. So maybe your bone mineral density is amazing. Maybe you have good blood glucose levels, but maybe for you it's a mental health issue. And eventually that wheel will turn, it'll get to that broken spoke and the wheel will stop turning. Once that wheel stops turning, that's where you lose your health span, you lose your lifespan. That's where you start to get issues. So how should we approach what exercise you should be doing? We should approach this by saying, what is our broken spoke? If you have something like low bone mineral density, that is the broken spoke. You need to be doing exercise which is going to increase your bone mineral density because maybe your blood glucose levels are perfect, but your bones are brittle. We don't need to be doing things that are going to improve your blood glucose levels when there is something else that's either going to cause premature death or a loss in your health span, a loss of the quality of life. So this is how we can start to establish what we should be doing. Because as we age, there are certain changes that we go through in our body. There's a net, a loss of, of strength. There's a loss of power. There's a loss of balance. There's a loss of coordination. There's a loss of those, those fine sort of motor control skills that allow you to, to move objects easily. You start to lose your stability. Um, you start to lose your posture. You start to lo lose your reaction speed. You're unable to react to falls. Of course, as soon as you have a fall, it then becomes a slippery slope through hospital, starting to lose your function, and then you can't exercise at all. So what I would like to talk about is what we can do to prevent these things, to prevent the loss of strength, to prevent the, the falls, and to prevent this loss of stability, of coordinated movement, these changes in posture. Because if we can do this, and if we can fight some of these effects of aging, then we can start to fight all of those health factors I talked about before, which are gonna reduce your quality of life, or your length of life. Here's what I wanna do, I wanna keep this quite simple. I wanna keep this as quite a minimalist approach to, to what you guys need to be doing to, to live longer, to live healthier, um, and to really have that health as a focus for the absolute long term. You may have heard of the 80-20 principle. The 80-20 principle basically tells us that, um, that we wear 20% of the clothes in our wardrobe 80% of the time. That our dinners every night, we eat 20% of the food, 80% of the time. Um, maybe if you have a business, 80% of your income comes from 20% of the clients. And we see this rule again and again in nature. So what I would like to do, because obviously there's, there's a lot of information out there about exercise. There's a lot of people telling you what you should be doing and a lot of experts and specialists in this field. I wanna try and tear some of that down and say, right, let's not worry about these thousand things we should be doing. And, and look at the absolute basics. What are the basics we should be doing? What is the 20% of exercise that you should be doing that's gonna give you the 80% of the benefits? Effectively, this is a lazy guide to exercise. It's a minimalist guide to exercise. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with finding efficiency in your exercise program. It's not about how much you can do before your body and mind start to break down. It's about how little you can do before your body and your mind start to break down. What is the smallest effective dose? What is the low hanging fruit? That's what I wanna talk about. And I want to introduce you to a principle called progressive overload. Sounds fancy, but it's actually really simple. It tells you that if you lift two kilos on Monday, by Monday the following week, if you lift two and a half kilos, your body will continue to improve and continue to adapt. If you lift two kilos on Monday, your body will adapt to that two kilos. The following week you lift two kilos again, your body doesn't need to adapt because it already has. It's already changed your skeletal system. It's maybe added a bit more bone, a bit more calcium to your bone. Maybe you've laid down a little bit more muscle so you've got some more strength that's gonna last you well into old age. This principle of progressive overload means you always do just a little bit more. If you stood up from a chair five times this week, maybe can you stand up from a chair six times next week? 
If you walked around the block last week, can you walk around the block? And then just to the tree in the corner, on the corner and back, that progressive overload, that, that little bit more. So that's the first principle. As we age, we start to have this deterioration, this loss of muscle mass, this loss of strength, this loss of power. And that is gonna result in a lot of these effects of aging, a lot of these health effects. So always try and do a little bit more. Use it or lose it, it's a common adage, and it's absolutely true in this case. The second thing I wanna talk about is, is the type of exercise that you should be doing. And unequivocally, the absolute best form of exercise you need to be doing is called resistance exercise. All of the health benefits can come from your resistance-based exercise. And this is a form of exercise where you are doing some sort of lifting. You're either lifting weights, like maybe a barbell or, or dumbbells, um, or a sack of flour, or a couple of one liter water bottles, um, or maybe you're lifting your own body weight. Again, you stand up from a chair, your body is the weight. Maybe you're doing a push-up, your body is the weight. Maybe you're lifting a sack of potting mix onto your shoulder, onto a shelf, that becomes the weight. It doesn't have to be this beautiful, contoured, colored bar with plates. It just needs to be something. So that's the first thing you need to be doing. You need to be, you need to be lifting weights, and it's a certain type of weight that you need to be lifting. Not the sort of weight where you go to a gym and you pull out a pin and you stick it in number four, and then you do your reps. That's a fixed range of motion. It basically tells you where to move your body. Maybe you're doing a leg press at the gym. Maybe you're doing something like a chest press at the gym. Maybe you're doing lat pull downs at the gym. These are movements where the machine is deciding for you where you should be moving. There's a train track that you're moving that resistance against. Now, it's all a continuum, and of course, that's not a bad thing, so if you're doing that, please keep doing it. I don't want you to stop just because some guy told you in a webinar that you shouldn't be lifting weights this way. It is infinitely, infinitely better than doing nothing. But if you're gonna be spending the time doing the exercise, there is a better approach. And this is to have more of a free weight approach. And this is where instead of you being told by the machines where you should be moving, which is gonna build some strength, but you're gonna lose a lot of your stability, you're gonna lose things like balance, which I don't need to tell you are really important in older age, instead of being told where to move, you should be doing weights that force you to stabilize. So if we're looking at something like a shoulder press, so maybe you go to the gym, you sit on a machine, you put that pin in, and you press those weights, those handles overhead. They tell you where to go. Instead, maybe you could get two dumbbells, a dumbbell in each hand, do that exact same movement, that exact same type or pattern of movement, but now you're getting all these other benefits. You still do the same number. You still do the same weight. You still, it still takes you the same amount of time. But now you're getting all these added benefits. These, these added benefits that are coming from you choosing where those weights are gonna go. Now in terms of which exercises you should choose, again, there are so many exercises out there and just about all of them are good. And my somewhat controversial opinion is that even exercises that that are not done with the best technique, I would still prefer someone to do that than to not exercise at all. Sure, there is some danger of short-term issues with musculoskeletal system with your joints and your muscles, and it's not ideal. So ideally, you wanna be moving well. But I would rather someone do something with incorrect technique. At least they're doing something, rather than just ending up in that nursing home, in the bed, unable to keep functioning, unable to, to keep improving their health. Um, but that being said, the type of exercise you should choose, we're looking to choose a compound exercise. Now, this basically means that you're using multiple joints in your body at any one time to do the movement. Quite simply, it's a much more efficient way to exercise and it's a much more functional way to exercise. And by that, I mean it's a type of exercise you can do which is gonna create a long-term change for your body and it's gonna to start to emulate or copy or mirror those exercises you're doing in your life. Look at something like a squat, a movement that most people would be quite familiar with. A squat is basically just a glorified term for standing up from a chair. So you don't have to do that sort of rocking to build up momentum and finally you can get off that low couch. A squat is just standing up from something. Something like a deadlift, a deadlift is picking up the weight off the ground. It's not a deadlift, it's nothing that was invented. It's, it's nothing that was contrived and put together by humans and engineered to be the ultimate exercise experience. It's not that at all. 100,000, a million years ago, we were deadlifting. We were picking up rocks off the ground. These are movements that our body has evolved 
to do and therefore movements that are amazing for our body because they match what the demands hundreds of generations ago were for humans. The thing with these compound exercises, like I said, not only are they functional, do they emulate what happens in life, which means it's going to improve your life, which is the whole point of exercise as we age, but they're very efficient. So if you look at a movement like a push-up, again, it's a movement that most people will be quite familiar with. In a push-up, your, your shoulder is moving. In a push-up, your elbow is moving. And you're forced to stabilize your body, to keep your body strong, using all those, all those muscles around your abs, around your lower back, around your hips. There's a lot going on there. It's a compound movement. It's a movement that involves a lot of joints and a lot of muscles. Now here's the thing, you use a lot of muscles and it burns big bits of energy. So in terms of the energy expenditure that comes from the exercise, it's through the roof. It's also a functional movement as we talked about and it teaches your body how to integrate together. You get a lot of work done in a short amount of time. Because you're using your, your triceps to straighten your arm, you're using your shoulder muscles, you're using your chest muscles, using the muscles around your hips and your abs and your back, as I've spoken about. You're using all of these muscles in one single exercise. If you're doing the opposite of compound movements, which are called isolation movements, where you're just using one muscle at a time with each exercise, there's, there's no functional benefit, or there's very little functional benefit, because it doesn't emulate what you're doing in life, but it's really inefficient. There are much better things you could be doing with your time than five individual exercises when you can just do the one to cover all of those different muscle groups. So to so make sure those movements are compound, lots of muscle groups being used at the same time. The next thing that you should be considering when choosing your exercises is the movement speed. Now, this is something that I think is, is super important and really overlooked. Yes, it's important to move with good technique, of course, as we've already talked about, but it's really important to move with speed, and I'll tell you why. You've probably seen people as they age, maybe you've experienced this yourself, your walking starts to slow, your steps become a little shorter, your strides become shorter, um, you can't move as fast, and then you're walking along a footpath, there's an uneven brick and uneven bit of concrete, and you, you catch your toe on it. Now, this is something you've probably done hundreds of times in your life. And, and as you're younger, you can make that quick, very fast reaction to that. You can shoot your other foot out in front and you, can, and you can catch yourself before having that trip. Because you were able to move with speed, you were able to move fast. What happens, however, as you age, you start to slow down. Your movement speed starts to drop. So when you catch your toe on that uneven edge, you're no longer able to move fast enough to shoot that foot out in front and stop yourself from falling. You end up going down, your arm goes out first to try and catch the fall, you break your wrist, you fall on your hip, you break your hip. Movement speed is key. To, boot, to, to improve your power, you need to move fast because power, as opposed to strength, strength is just being strong. It's lifting something really heavy. And sure, that is really important and it should absolutely form part of your training. But if all you can do is lift heavy and slowly, it's not gonna stop you from having that fall. Think of this like a boxer. So imagine a boxer is throwing a punch. It's, it's a really strong boxer. He's a really strong fighter, very, very strong. But no matter how strong he is, even if it's a very strong punch, but it's thrown very slowly, it's not gonna do any damage when he hits his competitor. However, if you have a boxer who is much less strong, but is more powerful, they don't have as much muscle behind them, but they can move fast, you can see that that is gonna do a lot more damage. That's exactly what we're talking about here. So when you're exercising, when you're lifting weights, when you're doing your compound movements as we've already spoken about, your intent should be to move fast. Because if you, if you move fast when you're exercising, if you train fast, it will make you fast. Just like a boxer is gonna throw fast punches in training because the boxer's event is that fight night, for you, you need to move fast when you're training because your final event is that dance at your grandkids wedding, is throwing around a netball or kicking a footy or playing cricket with your grandkids. That is your event. And to train for that event, you need to train that speed. Maybe your event is not a dance or kicking a ball or throwing a ball. Maybe your event is saving yourself when you're about to trip and, and fall, stick out the arm and break your wrist and hip. Maybe that's the event you're training for. It's an unknown, and that's the key here. The, all of the events that happen as we age, these unknown events, these, these spokes, remember of this wagon wheel that are tested as that, 
as that wheel starts to turn, those broken spokes, we don't know when they're gonna be tested. Maybe you've got a thousand spokes on your wagon wheel and maybe 999 out of those thousand are super strong. But all you need is that one broken spoke and it may be tested today, it may be tested tomorrow, it may be tested in 30 years time, but I promise you at some stage that spoke is going to be tested. So move fast. Yes, do your strength work. Yes, do compound movements. And yes, you should be going pretty heavy because that's how we build our strength. You can't just go light and fast. You need to be lifting heavy weights and you need to be lifting those heavy weights quickly. That's gonna set you up. Let's talk more about which exercises you can choose. And again, I've said I wanna give you a easy, low-hanging fruit, minimalist approach to your exercise. I'm gonna give you four movements or I'm gonna give you four groups of movements. And if you wanna keep this super simple, all I want you to do is choose one exercise from each of these four movements. And we're gonna start with what I think is the most important. And if you only do one thing ever, only one exercise ever for the rest of your life, it's this first one. It's an exercise from this first group. And that is some sort of squat. If you, if you lose strength in your upper body, yes, it's gonna impact your life. Maybe you need help opening a jar. Um, maybe you need help putting your baggage in the overhead compartment on the plane. But you can sort of get by. If you lose strength in your legs, however, that starts that, that slow spiral, that slow deterioration where we lose our functionality. Suddenly, you can't walk around. You can't get up from a couch without rocking first or without someone helping you. Um, you, can't, you can't move around. You can't get out of bed. And it's then a, a pretty fast spiral into this loss of, of health span as well as a loss of lifespan. So... Of these four groups of exercises, the first is a squat. And a squat is, again, just a glorified way of saying, stand up from a chair. And, and honestly, if you're at the point now where you feel like your health is starting to go downhill, where you feel like your, your health span is starting to suffer, my biggest piece of advice would be, find a dining room chair, sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up, and stand up fast, because we're looking to build our power as well. Um, and do that five times and do that every day for a week. And then next week, do it six times. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way to Sunday. Next week, do it seven times. And maybe, maybe seven is tough. Maybe it's hard for you to stand up and sit down on that chair, chair seven times in a day. So break it up and do it four times in the morning, three times in the evening. Um, maybe for you, the number is 50. Maybe it's not seven. Gradually increase what you're doing. Progressive overload, always doing a little bit more in your body. So you need to be doing some sort of squatting based exercise. So maybe it is a squat, standing up from a chair. Maybe it's something like a lunge. Maybe you're stepping up onto a low box. Of course, if these are new to you, you're gonna be tested with your balance. So make sure you've got something to hold on to or someone to help support you if, if this is an issue for you. Um, some sort of movement where you feel the muscles down the front of your legs doing some work. Those muscles, of course, are called your quadriceps. And it's so important to maintain strength in those. Keeps your knees strong, keeps your hips strong, and it keeps you functioning. So there is what I would say is the most important group of exercises to choose from. And if you're only choosing one of these four and you just want something ridiculously super simple, that is the group you choose from. The second group of exercises, this is where instead of feeling the muscles at the front of your body working, we're now starting to use the muscles at the back of our body. These are the hamstrings, which run up the back of the thighs, the muscles around your glutes and your bum, and your lower back. And of course, if we can keep your lower back strong, we keep lower back pain away. And as you may remember from that list I gave you a few minutes ago, lower back pain is the biggest cause in a westernized society of, of losing your health span, not your lifespan, your health span, how long you can stay healthy for. So choose some sort of exercise where you're lifting something up off the ground. Now, of course, technique is important here. You don't wanna be lifting it with your back all rounded and hunched over, because if you think about it, this rounded hunched position of your back is the position that you see a lot of these old, old people start to get into as they age. What happens if you exercise in this position, your body is gonna re-engineer itself to assume that this is the position that you want it to go in. If you can lift weights with a nice flat back, it's gonna teach your body that that's the position that you should be in. So then when you're walking around, you walk a little taller. We had a client at Range of Motion. Um, he's just got back into exercise. Um, he's in his early 60s. And, and he, said to me, he said to me earlier this week, he's been back four times and he said, 
I feel like I'm taller. Now, of course, he's not taller, but he's standing differently because he's starting to work these muscles on the back of his body. So that is my second group of exercises for you. Choose a movement which is going to lift a weight off the ground. Just pick something up off the ground, maybe a bucket full of water, maybe a brick, maybe just your car keys. Start off nice and easy and learn that movement pattern. If you're interested in the correct technique on how to do this, please comment below this video, guys, and I'll post you some demo videos. I have demo videos of all these exercises I'm talking about, so just drop a comment below and I'll post you a video so you can see exactly how things are done. The third group of exercises we're gonna talk about is an exercise where you are pulling something towards you. Uh, now this can be a little trickier because it's not just about standing up from a chair or picking something up off the ground. This is pulling something towards you. So maybe you're leaning forward and pulling a dumbbell as if you're, as if you're starting a, um, a lawnmower or a chainsaw, that sort of movement. Um, maybe you are under a table, sitting under a table and you hold under the edge of the table and pull yourself up so you can get your chin on top of it. Maybe if you have access to a gym, you can do uh, pull-ups or chin-ups or lap pull-downs. You wanna do some sort of exercise where you are pulling something heavy towards you. Maybe you're pulling it on a horizontal plane. Maybe you're pulling it on a vertical plane. This starts to get those muscles around your upper back working. And the reason I've put this third on the list, not fourth, is because we tend to do a lot of pushing based stuff in our life anyway. But those muscles involved in pulling, those postural muscles that are gonna keep our shoulders open, make us stand tall, make us breathe deep, these things are really important. The final group, as I've alluded to, these are your pushing exercises. And your pushing based exercises are things like push-ups, maybe lifting a weight overhead, maybe you're at the gym doing a bench press. And what you can see is these four groups we've talked about, the first one, the squat, is using those muscles in your lower body down the front of your body. The second one, the deadlift, they're using the muscles in your lower body but down the back of the body. Then we have the muscles that are pushing, then we have the muscles that are pulling. Four movements only, and a whole bunch of different exercises we can choose in each of those. Again, if you're interested in those, please reach out and let me know and I'll send you some details. Um, but we really only need to do those four groups of exercises. You don't need to go and do 12 exercises every time you go to the gym. Just tick those four boxes. And if you can do that, you're guaranteed that you're keeping a really good balance in your body and you're gonna prepare your body for whatever life may throw at it. It's going to help to prepare your body for when that broken spoke comes along, it's no longer broken. You've made that spoke strong because we've ticked all of those boxes. But, but how about your cardiovascular exercise? So, you know, a lot of people will go to the gym or they'll do some exercise where they walk briskly um, around the block. Maybe they go to the gym and they get on the bike or the treadmill. Maybe they cycle a lot. And this is great. Again, there is no bad exercise. It all just exists on a continuum, and all I'm trying to do is move you up this end of the continuum where you can get a lot of return for the work that you're doing. So where does the breathing stuff fit into this? Where's the stuff that makes you huff and puff? Well, again, we're, we're trying to stay really efficient with what we're doing here. So how about we take this, this strength work to get stronger and to get more powerful, to move faster, um, and, and then we take this cardiovascular work that makes you huff and puff, and how about we throw these things together? Because there is no determinant in nature, there's nothing in our evolutionary past that says, well, on Mondays we do strength work, um, we're gonna lift a big heavy boulder, then on Tuesdays we're gonna chase down a woolly mammoth, uh, then on Wednesdays we're just gonna lift our body weight and climb a tree, um, then on Thursdays we're gonna run away from a saber-toothed tiger. There's no distinction made in nature, and neither should there be in our training particularly if you want really well-rounded fitness and if you want to work on all the different spokes of this wagon wheel. So how do we combine the two? Well, you take an exercise from the first group, from group A. These are your squat type movements. And you do 10 of them. And, and then you go into, into one of these other groups. Maybe we say, okay, we're now going to do a pushing exercise. And you do 10 of them. Then you come to the deadlift, to those all those muscles down the back of your body. You do 10 of those. Then you go to your pulling exercises and do 10 of those. And maybe you cycle through that five times. Or maybe you cycle through it just once. Maybe you do it twice. Maybe you do it 10 times. Maybe instead of doing 10 of each, you do three of each. It all depends on your level because intensity is relative and it's different for all of us. But what's gonna happen by alternating between these different muscle groups, these different movement types, is you're gonna get something called blood shunting. And blood shunting is basically where you do your squats, you sit down in your dining room chair and you stand up, you sit down and you stand up, you sit down and you stand up, and your heart says, whoa, we're sending all this blood to, to the quadriceps, to the muscles down the front of our legs. 
it sends all the blood there, but then suddenly you're asking your heart to send the blood to the muscles for your push-ups. So maybe you're using your dining room table, you have your hands on the dining room table, and you're doing some push-ups on the table there because that's what you can do, it's appropriate for you. And your heart says, hey, we were just sending the blood to the legs, now we need to redistribute it all the way back up to the arms. And to do that, you start to breathe a little heavier, your lungs start to work, your heart starts to work, so you get that protective effect from cardiovascular disease. And no sooner has all the blood gone to those pushing muscles that you're now asking it to go back to the lower body because you're now going to be picking up a stack of books off the floor for your deadlifts. You're getting stronger because you're doing this resistance-based exercise, either using your body weight or using some sort of external load. So you're getting stronger. You're moving fast. You're not just slowly going through the motions. You're doing it with real intent. Because you're moving fast, because you're moving with speed, you're developing power. And, and then you're quickly alternating between these four different movement types. There are four types of movements, so we know every single of these key movements in your body is being ticked, but you're moving quickly between them, which is making you breathe faster to get those cardiovascular benefits as well. You don't have to do much of this. You just need to do enough so the next day, you wake up and you sort of say, hey, I feel like my muscles have done a little bit of work. And at the time, you think, yeah, I'm, I'm out of breath. This is verging on being a little uncomfortable for me. I couldn't hold a conversation with someone. Now, of course, you can push that intensity faster and move faster from one exercise to the next. And that's absolutely fine. If you're breathing heavier, then you're getting more benefit in a short amount of time. And again, this is a minimalist approach. What's the least that we can do? And that's basically it. Choose exercises where you're lifting weights, either an external weight or your body. Choose compound movements where you have multiple joints working at the same time. And as you're moving, I want you to do them fast, obviously with good technique, but move fast to train that power. Choose from those four different groups of exercises, something where you're doing some sort of squat, something where you're doing some sort of deadlift, and then some sort of pushing and some sort of pulling. Then to get your cardiovascular benefit, shunt the blood, move quickly between these four movements and cycle through them. And really that's it. And, and we do this, as I've said, not, not for the sake of being able to do this faster, it's not to say, I can lift 100 kilos, I can do a push-up on my toes. That stuff doesn't matter at all. The stuff that matters is that you're around for your grandkids. The stuff that matters is that, that you can enjoy that first dance on their wedding day. You can spend time with the people you love. That's what really matters. We're not talking about fitness here, we're talking about health. We're not talking about lifespan, we're talking about health span. And hopefully, guys, if you can take some of these basic principles on board, then you can just start to tick over and just move up that continuum. Maybe you're a 2 out of 10 at the moment. I don't need you to be a 10 out of 10. I don't need you to be an Olympic athlete. Your event is that first dance. Your event is stopping that trip. Your event is fixing those broken spokes on your wagon wheel to ensure that when those spokes are tested, that cart just keeps on turning. Again, guys, if you have any questions on this, please either post them below um, and I will drop a response to those in the coming days. Uh, or of course, you can shoot me an email. My email is dan at rangeofmotion.net.au. That email again is dan at rangeofmotion.net.au. Feel free to send through any questions. If there is anything I can do to help, I will move heaven and earth and do anything I can to help you. Um, again, any questions, post them below, send me an email. If you'd like to learn a bit more about what we do at Range of Motion, head to rangeofmotion.net.au. Thank you very much to everyone who joined us live tonight. I do appreciate you giving up some of your Wednesday night. Um, I hope this has been of value to you. Those of you who are watching this on delay, I hope there has been some value here for you as well. Thanks again. My name is Dan Williams from Range of Motion, rangeofmotion.net.au if you would like more details on what we do. Work on that health span. Live longer, but also live better for the people that you love. See you next time.